And we're back. Uh, happy Thursday. Uh, today we'll be continuing on with our material from Chapter 1. And the focus of today, we'll talk a little bit about threading. Uh, we'll talk about process management a little bit. Uh, we'll also examine a little bit about the file system management. But before we do so, let's uh, address some administrative bits. The reading by today, the 3rd, Thursday, 2020, um, September, is the pages 3 through 51 in the main text. Please make sure you're keeping up with the reading. Okay. So last time when we talked about clusters, I said I'd mention a little bit, show you some pictures of clusters. And this particular uh, form factor, that's a computer. More specifically, it's a server uh, enclosure for a computer. And so a computer can look like a box like you're used to seeing, uh, or less and less so on your desktop or a laptop. But this is a server form factor uh, for a computer. It has processors, it has I.O., it has storage, and so forth. You can have some very specialized ones with things like graphics processing units or GPU. And this enclosure kind of looks like a pizza box to kind of give you a sense of the size of the scale. And this pizza box uh, form factor for a server is a so-called rack-mounted uh, server form factor. Now, on the side of this rack-mounted enclosure, you have some rails that mount. On this side, you have a rail. And on the other side, you have a rail. And this rail acts like a drawer system, right? Like uh, an actual drawer. You can pull it in, pull it out. There are little wheels that allow it to slide backwards and forward. And we here have here what looks like a closet. And this closet is a so-called server rack. And so this server rack accepts these server, rack-mounted server instances, and you fill up this rack with these servers, and it's a nice compact enclosure. Uh, we can have a lot of high-density, high-powered computation in a very small amount of space. And the server rack is about the size of uh, an armoire or a, or, a, or a closed closet. And so here on the side, you'll notice these tick marks and these tick marks, if you were to measure the length of these tick marks, each one would be 1.75 inches, which is also called one U or one unit. And so a typical rack mounted server is one of these one U units. And the entire uh, rack enclosure can accept a total of 42 of these one U units devices. So from here all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom, it has enough space, enough of these slots to accept 42 of these 1U units or 42U. So therefore, these full-size racks are often called 42U or 42 unit enclosures. Now, these server mounted or uh, rack mounted server form factors they have rails and these rails fit into slots uh in each one of these one u distances uh, positions and they literally can pull them out and pull push them in and once you push them in they come to rest and this front face plate you can use some hand nuts gnarled nuts and screw it down so that it doesn't slide out while it's operating so we have that 42U rack enclosure, and some components are 1U in size. You also have other components like disk arrays uh, and interruptible power supplies that might be anywhere from 1U to 2U up to even as much as 4U in its height. And so everything that you populate in this 42U enclosure all of the unit sizes, the heights, can only add up to a maximum of 42 before you fill up uh, the rack. Now, this rack is on wheels, and it's a little bit raised off the ground, so it makes for you being able to reconfigure where in a floor space 
this rock resides. Although you're not going to move it around very much because it gets quite heavy when it's populated with all the equipment. Okay, so you take these enclosures and you put them in a special facility, your data center, and this data center is engineered specifically uh, for these servers. And so on the front of the rack, you notice you have this mesh door, and in the back, the fans of each one of these components exhaust the warm air out and pulls the cool air in through the front. And so if you organize these 42U rack enclosures in a data center such that you turn the backs to one another, all the hot air gets vented out the back within this aisle, and all the cool air is pulled in through the front. Now, also, this data center is engineered specifically for these servers. And these floors are raised, and underneath these raised floors, you pipe in cool air. So you have enormous uh, air conditioning and ventilation systems. And so here we have cool air coming out, uh, these grates in the floor, and you can position grates anywhere to do a specific design to channel heat appropriately out of your data center server instances for your cluster. Now, here's a cutaway, and warm air rises and cold air drops. So if you have the warm air coming out the back, it's vented out the top, and it's exchanged, chilled, and pumped back down. And so you have this air recirculating constantly, warm air coming out, being cooled, cold air being pushed in to keep these things cool because the cooler you can keep your rack-mounted servers, uh, the faster you can run them. Okay, so these data centers, these raised floors with these racks uh, for your cluster, uh, they will sit in a specially engineered building, a data center, and this is what a data center might look like. To give you a sense of scale, that's an 18-wheeler truck. And so a data center might literally be 500,000 to millions of square feet of space. And these data centers are located in very specific locations because they need access to ample power, right? They need stable power, and they also take a lot of physical space. These facilities are absolutely enormous. And so such data centers might be things like Google's data centers, or Facebook's go to data centers, or Netflix data centers, and so forth. Okay, so this is what a server room looks like for a cluster. You have all of your racks mounted in a row, like the stacks in a library, and then you have these center aisles here, and there's a raised floor underneath, and they design everything specifically for the efficient power consumption and cooling of each one of these rack-mounted server instances. Now, of course, uh, these rack-mounted server units that form the, serv the computers or the server in your cluster you have so many of them, it's hard to determine the state of them when you're walking around. So they usually have lights. If you've ever been in a data center, it's kind of neat to see all the lights blinking and dancing. But they also instrument these things with lots of sensors uh, that feed in through a console uh, in a network operator's room. And you can very readily know the status of every part of your cluster. Okay. Uh, so this is what a cluster looks like it's just a bunch of machines in a data center that interact with one another over a high-speed communication uh, substrate. So let's continue on. And because I'm a little paranoid, let me make sure I'm still recording. Yes, I'm still recording. So when we last left off, we talked about process management and we talked about what a process is. And we said a process is the representation of a program in execution. And a process has, among other things, a so-called program counter. And it was the responsibility of this program counter to hold the memory location describing the next locate, the location of the next instruction that will be executed and a process executes these instructions sequentially. Now, of course, a process can have more than one stream of instructions uh, that it executes. When you do that, the abstraction for each stream of execution being executed is called a thread. And a multi-threaded process has one program counter for each thread, and I'll explain what a thread instance is. 
Now, typically on a system, you have many processes. Some of these are going to be user processes for user applications. Others are going to be operating system processes, and they all run concurrently at the same time on one or more CPUs. And this concurrency is achieved by sharing these CPUs or multiplexing them among all the processes and threads on your system. So let's take a look at our thread, but we'll begin by describing, let me go back here, select my pen, we'll begin by describing what is a process, and then we'll expand upon that process uh, on the thread portion. Okay, so here we have a CPU, and as we have been saying all along, CPU has a bunch of subsystems. We have the arithmetic logic unit, or ALU. We have the floating point unit, or FPU. We have our register file, and that register file stores temporary or intermediate values. We also have our instruction cache. We have our data cache. Instruction cache stores blocks of instructions. Data cache stores blocks of data. We also have our program, our flags, and our flags remember stuff about if something went to zero, if it's greater than zero, if we have an overflow, and so forth. We also have our memory management information. And then we also have this thing called a program counter. Now, this program counter, as we said, it holds the address in memory of the next instruction uh, for our program. So let's imagine we have memory here, and we have our program stored in memory. That's our program. And let's say that program was at address 5, and we were executing the statement at address 5, and the next statement would be at memory location 6 or address 6. Now, when we're executing that statement at address 5, we're loading values, we're selecting operations from the floating point unit, for example. The program counter is going to contain the address or location of memory of the next instruction. Because when the CPU finishes executing the instruction at address 5, it needs to know where to go next. And so the next place is going to be stored in the PC, and so it will then increment and go to the next location. So after it selects that at instruction at location 6, the program counter increments itself from 6 to 7, and it knows that the next address is going to be the 7 when it's currently executing the statement at address 6. Okay, so the entire capability, and they're all attached to a bus. I forgot to draw the bus. Here's our system bus. In order to represent the ability to execute a stream of instructions, instruction 5, instruction 6, instruction 7, and so forth, you need this program counter. And so how a process executes this sequence of instructions or stream of instructions or instruction stream is using the program counter. Now, of course, as you execute instructions, what happens? Well, the state that you have consists of the flags, memory management information, uh, and the register file. Well, the memory and information is common to all users of the instruction stream, and that corresponds to dynamically allocated memory that your program might allocate. So the flags, the PC, our registers, and the instruction cache and data cache uh, is represented our ability to execute instruction streams. Okay. Now, I didn't mention it before, but I'll also throw in something called the stack pointer. And the stack pointer is used when you call functions. It's used to store temporary values in a last in, first out uh, manner, specifically for representing the parameters and the return values and the local variables for functions. So we have all of this state that is a result of, in, of executing streams of instructions. We have the flags. We have the program counter, we have the stack pointer, and we have the register file. Okay, so now the difference, if we wanted to represent a process, process, we're going to have representing our program and execution all of the state information. 
Well, we have the cache information instruction. All right, well, it's in our instruction cache, the data. That's in our data cache. We're going to have our register file. Okay. We're also going to have our flags because the flags are the result of executing some instruction. And then we're going to have the program counter as well. So the process execution state is represented as these entities that you need in order to note down where you are in your stream of instructions as well as stack pointer, where you are in your stream of instructions as well as what the current status is of this process. So when you have multi-threaded execution, a thread represents a different instruction stream. So how does that happen? I have my process and that process it has all the regular state it usually does, but now we're going to abstract an execution stream into this idea of a thread. So let me draw here two threads, call that thread one and thread two. So what does a thread do? A thread says, I'm going to facilitate more than one instruction stream. An instruction stream is just a sequence of instructions. And as a sequence of instructions, you can accumulate temporary values. So you're going to need a register file to represent the thread of execution. Register file. You can execute functions. So here's my other register file. So you need register files to represent an execution context or a thread of execution. You have flags because the result of some operation could uh, cause an overflow or cause a comparison to zero. So you have flags. Here, you have flags in the other thread, okay? You also need a program counter because if you're going to execute a sequence or stream of instructions, you need to know the location in memory for those instructions. So you're going to have a program counter here as well. If you're going to call functions, you also need a stack pointer. So you're going to have a stack pointer that you're going to remember here and a stack pointer you're going to remember here. So what does this mean? Well, a process can have more than one thread, and this more than one thread represents different parts or functions in your program that you can now execute at the same time. So let's call that function F1. Let's call that function F2. So thread one could be executing function F1. Thread two could be executing function F2. So now as a thread, you can effectively execute multiple streams of instructions and each one of the pieces of information that you need to represent the entire state for an instruction stream, that instance is called a thread. And so one process can have one thread if it's not multi-threaded. A process can have more than one thread. In this case, we have two threads if it's multi-threaded. And the benefit of multi-threading is that you can share the CPU uh, much better if you're using multiple threads. So one thread might decide to go use the disk. It has to wait or block for input output to wait for the interrupt from the disk, for example, that says I'm done uh, transferring bytes from my memory through DMA uh, to RAM from my device buffer. So if uh, one thread encounters an instruction for which it has to wait for, say, some interrupt, another thread can be scheduled on the processor and that other instruction stream will continue to run. And so threading is a way of having better concurrency in making the use, efficient use of your CPU uh, much, much better, more improved. Okay, uh, so that's what threads are in a high level nutshell. We will certainly revisit this uh, when we get to uh, the module on process scheduling and thread scheduling. So let's look at these process management activities in general. The operating system is responsible for the following activities when it comes to process management. How do you manage uh, the switching of execution from one process, program in execution, to another process, which is a program in execution? So you need to both create and delete uh, user and system processes. You have to bring them into being. And bringing them into being means that you start executing and you associate with that execution of instructions a data structure that holds all of the information needed to represent that process. And the reason why you do this is because at some point, if you're going to switch from one program to the next, 
on your CPU, you have to save away all of that current state uh, representing where that post process is for the process that's going to stop executing when you switch uh, it off the processor. And so you need the data structure that allows you to store information and that data structure is allocated when you create and delete any kind of process, be that a user process or a system process. The suspend, suspending and resuming of a process, you can halt a process and then you can take a process and continue the running of that process. Now, when you suspend a process, what are you doing? You're stopping it and then you're storing away all of the state information. And when you resume, you're taking that state information, you're reading it onto the CPU, populating all of the information, then picking up where you left off. You need ways for providing for synchronization of processes, the orderly access to resources one at a time uh, when you can't have concurrent access to uh, limited resources. Mechanisms for process communication, so-called inter-process communication or IPC. How do you send data from one process to the next? Be that a process on the same core, on the same chip, a process on different chips, on the same bus, or processes in different boxes across the network. And so with this communication and the synchronization, you also need mechanisms for handling so-called deadlocks. When one process has grabbed control and locked a resource that another process is waiting for, and that other process at the same time has grabbed a resource that the first process is waiting for. That situation is called deadlock because you're always waiting for someone else, but you never get it because they have what you need and you have what they need. And so how do you handle this deadlock? Because deadlock will bring a system to a halt. So let's take a look briefly at memory management. And to execute a program, well, the program, both the code and the data, has to be in memory. Now, certainly programs are much bigger than the amount of memory that you have on your system. So that means either all or part of your program uh, might be resident in memory and all or part of your data might be resident in memory. So certainly, if it can't fit, what are you going to do? Well, we also have disk that's available. And what the operating system does, it says, I can't store the entire program in memory, so I'm going to chop it up into blocks, and I'm only going to bring certain blocks of the program into memory and certain blocks of the data into memory. So here we have our hard drive. And the hard drive is very inexpensive and it's very abundant, so it's a lot of space. So here's your program. And let's say that program is going to create some data. So this pro, uh, disk is attached to the system bus. And also attached to that system bus is your main memory. And I've drawn that main memory small purposefully. So I take my program and I chop it up into smaller pieces, and then I load each piece into memory. So let's call that the first piece of my program. So that's my program P, and that's the first piece of my program. So now I execute statements from that first piece of the program, and some of those statements might allocate data. Now, of course, if I keep allocating data, eventually I'm going to allocate more data than I can store. So if I allocate a lot of data, what does it do? Well, some of that data it keeps in memory, and other parts of that data, I'll call that data, it keeps on disk. Now, what portion does it keep on disk? Well, it keeps that portion of the program that it's not currently executing from. Because in order to execute, you need to fetch from memory that instruction or block of instructions to the CPU. So definitely, the current part of your code that you're currently executing that has to be in memory, okay? And then also that piece of data, you keep resident in memory that piece of data that you're currently either reading or writing because it has to be in memory to read it or write it. So this memory management is the keeping in memory of parts of programs and data, not just for your program, but for other programs and the detection of when you're using a piece of a program or using a piece of data and making sure that you always keep resident in memory those portions of program and data that you're actually using at a time. So you could have most of your program and data on disk, 
And when you need to use it, or reference it, that's when you bring it into memory and then using just that piece. But underneath the covers to you, you just see it as if you had full access and memory to your program. But what it's really doing is bringing in pieces of your program on demand as you need it. And that's what memory management does. And this concept of bringing in pieces of your program is called virtual memory. Okay, so memory management does the following. It determines what is in memory and when it should be in memory. You're optimizing CPU utilization and the response of a computer to users. And memory management activities include tracking which part of memory are currently being used and by whom, deciding which process or parts of processes and data to move in and out of memory, allocating and deallocating memory space as needed. So all of this is handled by the operating system as it pertains to memory management. So let's take a look at storage management. For storage management, well, the operating system provides a singular view, that's a logical view of information that is stored on disk. And so what it does is hide or abstracts the physical layout or properties of the underlying system. And so the logical storage unit for a file system is called a file, right? Hence the name file system, of course. But a file just looks like a continuous tape, contiguous set of blocks of data that are concatenated one after the other after the other in sequence. And you associate this block of data with a name. So that block, when you reference that name, it has a starting location. And depending on how much data is in the file, it has an ending location. And so each storage medium is controlled by a device. You have a disk device, you have a tape device, and each one has certain properties. Here at the bottom, we see a hard disk drive, and you can see uh, the platters of the hard drive. So here you have the platters of the hard drive, and then you also have what's called the read write head. And the read write head is at the end and it can read or write ones and zeros, has a little electromagnet there. And then you have an actuator arm here, and the actuator arm will move left or right, position the read write head over different tracks on your platters. Now this read write head is more than just a single read write head. In this cutaway, you'll see we have three platters, and each platter has a read write head. So this actuator will move positioning the read write head over a certain track on our disk. And so the disk is organized physically as a bunch of concentric circles or tracks, and the ones and zeros are encoded along a track going in a circle. And then we go out to the next track and out to the next track and out to the next track to the next platter on the inside. Again, concentric tracks out to the end and then the next platter. So for a disk, we often talk about a location on the disk as described by the platter, the track, and the tracks are numbers, and something called the sector. A sector is nothing more than some region of a track. So you can imagine this disk divided radially out into these sections, and each section is called a sector. And so a disk is physically organized into tracks, platters, and sectors. And the ones and zeros are written in each sector going around a track for the concentric tracks across all of the platters. Okay. So what does a logical file look like? We talked about the physical file. Well, a logical file has a name. And associated with that name is just a long sequence of bytes as if they were written sequentially on some contiguous storage tape. So you might have your one, zero, one, zero, and so forth, one, one, zero, et cetera. Now, when we translate that to what happens on the disk, I'm just gonna draw two platters, 
you have the center spindle and then you have your track. Maybe that's track zero and maybe that's track one. Okay, so you're going to store the bytes of this disk and each sector here, each length of along a track is going to be represented as some unit of data for your file called blocks. And so you take the blocks of your file, you write them 101 in a sector and then 011 going along the track. Now they're not necessarily contiguous on the disk. And so what ends up happening in your file, you have the first block and it's going to have a little pointer, a little reference that talks about where the next block is located. And so you string together this linked list of blocks that tell you where to find the next block of the file. And each block corresponds to a set of sectors in which you write data. So that might be the first block. The next block, so that's block one, block two, block three. So block one might be here, block two might be here, and block three might be over here on this disk. And so what you're doing when you represent the logical file, that logical file translates to a list of blocks where each block contains data, one, zero, one, and these are laid out all over uh, your physical disk devices. And so the entity that maps between this construct indirectly through this list of blocks to the physical location, the platter, uh, the track, and the sector, that's called your file system. And the entity that holds all this information is typically a table structure. It's called your file table. Okay. And so this is the relationship, this contiguous tape associated with the name, tape of data. This is your logical file. And all of this that boils down into a set of locations, platter, track, sector, that's called your physical file. Because it describes physically how these units of data are laid out as described by different locations, the platter, the block, the track rather, and the sector on that mechanical disk device. Okay, so what is file system management? It's usually organized into so-called directories. A directory is nothing more than a table that contains file names, and those file names correspond to beginning locations on disk for blocks of data. It provides, this file system provides access control, and that access control determines who can access that file. Operating system activities include, for file management, storage management, the creation and deletion of files and directories, where directory is just a special table that can hold other directories or files, where directory is just a list of files. It has primitives to manipulate files and directories. You can add to files, add to directories, delete them, rename them, and so forth. It also maps files onto secondary storage. So it allows you to take a file, this linked list of blocks, and map it into platters, tracks, and sectors on the disk. It also does backup of files onto more stable, non-volatile storage media, things like tapes, because they still use tapes for very high density, albeit slow, uh, storage. Okay. So mass storage management, usually disks are used to store data that doesn't fit in main memory. So if it doesn't fit in memory, data that has to be kept for a long time, it's ushered on or offloaded to um, your disk drive. And so the proper management of this disk is very, very important. And moreover, the speed of your computer is gonna be limited on the disk subsystem and the algorithms that you use. So you might wonder, gosh, well, why is that? Because I thought you told me that memory is very fast. Yes, memory is very fast. But if you have your system memory here, and it's connected to the bus, and also connected to the bus is your disk drive. And I said that you're keeping your program mostly on disk, and only parts of your program, so there's a part of the program, are kept in memory. So if 
the disk subsystem is slow or inefficient, when it comes time to execute the next part of your program, and I'll draw that in dotted line, it's going to take a really long time to load that next part of the program across the bus and into memory. And so the entire speed of your computer is going to hinge on this file system, uh, this storage management, because that storage is used not only for data files, it's also used as temporary storage for parts of your program and parts of your working data in memory. Okay. So what, do the, what activities does the OS engage in? It does free space management, how you handle what you do with your free space. Maybe you move things around in memory uh, to kind of fit things together like a jigsaw puzzle better so that you have more free space. It does allocation of storage, how you carve out parts of memory and make it own uh, and, and have it owned by a particular process. How you do the scheduling of the disk. What parts of the disk do you read and when? Because if you read things at opposite extremes of the disk all the time, the time it takes for your read write head to move is going to end up adding up and slowing down your disk, your disk, disk access performance. And so some storage doesn't have to be fast. Things that you uh, store for much later, like doing archives, so-called tertiary storage, like optical drives, magnetic tapes. But these still have to be managed by your operating system. Okay, so here is a table. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. It's in the book. But this table looks at the different types of storage in a hierarchy, and it contrasts the speed, access speed, uh, the implementation, as well as the relative size of the various types of memory. So at the top of the hierarchy, you have registers. And registers exist on your CPU. It's relatively small, and it's intended for temporary values. It has very high bandwidth. The management of it is usually laid out by your compiler. And the disk cache, instruction cache, and the data cache on your CPU is the backup for the register file. And if you think about it, you're reading instructions out of the instruction cache and data out of the data cache, and these temporary values are put in the register. They're a subset of what's in your instruction cache and your data cache. So these registers are typically on the order of one kilobyte. It's very small. It's very custom memory because these are circuits on the same silicon uh, as the rest of your CPU. We also have cache. It's also on-chip. There are special cases with off-chip, but they can be of the size on the order of 16 megabytes. Now, this is managed by hardware, right? This is the pulling in uh, into the cache, uh, which is a faster storage because it's on the chip on the CPU, faster storage than main memory. It's backed by main memory. Main memory is slower, but it's more abundant in terms of size than uh, your cache, both instruction and data cache. You also have main memory, and it can be gigabytes, like 64 gig of RAM uh, is very typical. And the access time is slower than cache, but it's still relatively fast in about 80 to 200 nanoseconds, roughly. And it's high bandwidth. Now, this main memory, it's managed by the operating system. It's the operating system that ushers things onto and off of uh, main memory. And the backing for this fast main memory is that next thing that's slower, namely the disk. Now, there are different types of disks. You have a uh, magnetic disk, that's these platters that rotate. You also have solid state disks. The solid state disk is very typical nowadays. They have one terabyte. Usually it's flash memory. It's a little bit slower than main memory, but it still does pretty well, high bandwidth. It is also managed by the operating system because of this file system management, this mapping of the logical file system onto this physical file system. It's managed by the OS. And then we have backup magnetic disk, and you can have tens of terabytes of magnetic disk. That's not unusual. It's relatively slow, but it can store a lot of information that's typically managed by the operating system because backup is part of the OS responsibility to kick off that backup uh, process. So this describes the movement of data between levels of storage, and it talks about the relative speed and which storage is the backup uh, for that faster storage, i.e. the faster storage is the cache of sorts, uh, for the slower, larger um, storage. So a day in the life when you migrate data from a disk to register, multitasking environments have to be careful uh, to use the most recent values. And it doesn't matter uh, where it is stored in the storage hierarchy. And the reason for this is that the value 
will propagate from disk to main memory to cache to the instruction registers. So whenever you fetch data, you want to make sure at the CPU or wherever you're working on it in memory or what have you, that you have the most current up-to-date version of the data or else you can have problems. Now, this is exacerbated when you have a multiprocessor system because you have to provide so-called cache coherency, which is making sure that the different copies of cache all understand the same version of this value. And in a distributed system, it's even more complex because you can have multiple copies of data uh, in different places. So let's take a look at multiprocessor systems and let's look at distributed systems. So I'm gonna draw a line down the middle here. On the left side, I'm gonna have multi-processor system, so multiple CPUs on separate chips, and then I'm gonna have distributed system, so multiple CPUs on different boxes on the right. So with the multi-processor system, we're just gonna draw two processes. This is the first CPU, that's one chip, and we have another CPU, that's the second chip, CPU two. So we have CPU one and two, we have the usual components in our CPU, ALU, we have floating point unit, uh, we also have our register file, we have our program counter, and I'm not going to draw all the components, we have the instruction cache, and we have our data cache. Okay, so likewise in the other CPU, we have our ALU, we have our floating point unit, FPU, we have our register file, we have our program counter, and we have our instruction cache, and we have our data cache. Okay, so now, suppose these are both connected in a von Neumann architecture to the same system bus. Okay, that's great. And then we also have memory here, hanging off the system bus. And let's say, you know, we have a disk, but we're not going to draw in the disk. So suppose you have a list, and in memory, you have some linked list or some other type of list or array. And now let's say you have the numbers 1, 2, uh, 4, 5, 6 in a list. You pull in this list in memory. It's put into the data cache, and so you have this list. 1, 2, 4, 5, 6. And you pull in this list into the data cache over here. One, two, four, five, six. So all of a sudden, a process runs on the first CPU and it decides to insert an element in this list. It inserts it and in the CPU data cache, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So now this list has changed. Now, if this process running on CPU 2 decides to read something and make a change to this uh, list that's in the data cache. When this write occurred to insert this new value 3, you have to propagate that change to the other instance. Otherwise, the process running CPU 2 will have the incorrect version of this list and an error will occur. Well, one of the things that happens is when you write to this array in the data cache of CPU1, what happens is it notifies everyone else that has a copy, that copy is invalid. Moreover, it can take this cached copy in the data cache and push that update into memory. So now in memory, it has the values one, two, three, including the three it just inserted, four, five, six. And when this copy in CPU2 is invalidated, it's no longer good. When the next time that process in CPU2 wants to access that array, it says, oh, this is invalid. The data cache is, is going to go out to memory and fetch a new copy, which has the current version that has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay. So this idea of invalidating the duplicates and forcing you to fetch a new version it's called cache invalidation. And this idea of keeping all of the copies of this data up to date is called cache coherency. Cache coherency. And what cache coherency does is the keeping up to date 
of different copies so that everyone understands what the correct value is because they can get out of date, right? You make this update here. If you don't propagate the, that update, then the other copies are out of date and therefore invalid and bad things can happen. Let's take the example of a distributed system. Suppose you have um, your machine, and that's your host, your machine, okay? And let's say you're connected to a network through a router. And let's say, for example, local to you through the internet is a YouTube server somewhere. And that YouTube server, a machine, it stores on a disk YouTube content. So here's a YouTube video. That's YouTube video. Okay, so let's say you have one YouTube video and you have another instance of a YouTube server and that YouTube server has that same version of a YouTube video. So here is your YouTube video. Okay, so now let's say that video happens to be your video, and when you access YouTube, you're going to be routed to this local copy of the YouTube server closest to you, and that has a certain YouTube video in it. So let's say you take that and you upload a new video. So now you say video V2, and that gets put in your local cache. So this entire database containing all of the YouTube videos at the moment where you upload a new YouTube video, your local server for YouTube, its database has that video V2, but it doesn't currently exist in maybe the YouTube server for the West Coast. Maybe this is East Coast, and this is the West Coast. So when you upload a new video to your YouTube channel, well, everyone's supposed to see it, not just the people on the East Coast. So what happens here? Well, this server says, hmm, I have a new video V2. I'm going to notify all of the other YouTube server instances, hey, there's a difference here, and it's going to fetch from me that video V2 and install a copy inside that server instance. So that keeping the database on the West Coast the West database, synchronized with the database on the East Coast, that's a form of cache coherency. The caches involved are the databases for the East Coast and the databases for the West Coast. Okay, And so this idea of motion of data is very, very important, and that's something that's managed by the operating system. Okay. And so one of the purposes that we discussed about of the operating system is to hide the details of various resources. Now, hiding these peculiarities of I.O. devices is really important because it makes these I.O. devices generic and the interfaces to them very clean. The I.O. subsystem of the operating system is responsible uh, for doing this. The I.O. subsystem does a number of things. It does memory management of I.O including the storage of information, be that outbound or inbound, to the device buffer for the I.O. device. And so it does memory management of I.O., including the buffering, the caching, and the spooling of data to the I.O. device, as well as data from the I.O. device. It presents a general device driver interface to make it clean and hide the details of what it means to interact with the low-level details of the I.O. device. It also gives you the facility of so-called device drivers, pieces of software that know how to speak to the devices associated with the I.O.'s device. So the operating system, the operating system's I.O. subsystem is responsible for all of this abstraction and all of these tasks. So let's take a look, lastly, at protection and security. The operating system provides protection and security, where protection 
is a mechanism for controlling the access of the processes or users to resources defined by the operating system. Now, what does that mean? Every entity on your operating system is assigned something called a username, user name. And a username is an entity that uses, is used to identify a particular user of the system. Now, associated with the username is the ability to read a resource, to write a resource, or to execute something associated with that resource. And so what this protection does is the operating systems facility to say who owns the resource, what they can do on that resource, read, write, or execute. And that is the operating system's mechanism for ensuring that the correct entity on the computer is allowed to do certain actions on all of the resources. And this includes resources that are only for use by the operating system, as well as resources that are for use by arbitrary applications, uh, user applications. Security is the defense of the system against internal attacks and external attacks. And there are lots of different types of protection, both denial of service, so someone's depriving uh, the access to a system by flooding its ability to accept packets or accept information over the network, in addition to spoofing identity or trying to access internally parts of the machine uh, that you shouldn't have access to. So all of this protection and security is yet another job uh, of the operating system. So an operating system does a lot of things and this protection and security is often implemented using user identities. Now the user identity identifies the user and usually you authenticate yourself when you log in to the system to start interacting with them. A user ID is associated with all sorts of resources like files, processes, etc. And then you have this other construct called a group identifier. A group is a construct, it has a name, and it's used to associate sets of users. So if you have a set of users called students, uh, you have a group identi identifier. And there's something so-called privilege escalation that allows you as a user to change effectively what your ID is temporarily uh, to one that has more privileges. So I'm going to pop out of PowerPoint and I'm going to log into the terminal and show you an example of user IDs and group IDs. I see the following. Well, you notice here, I have D means it's a directory, the gholus directory. That's my directory for my account name. And the first three positions here after the D are WX. Now, the permissions for that field relate to the user that owns the resource, and that's read, write, execute. So the user is gholness, that's me, and I can read, write, or execute anything in this directory, okay? The next field, three characters, represents the group. So the group name is called staff, and it has a number of members, which I will not mention. And anyone that belongs to that group name staff can read or execute anything in this directory, but they cannot write anything. So that's less privileges. And then anyone that's not in the user first, who's not the user and who's not in the group is everyone else. And everyone else is allowed to read or execute, but not write. So you notice this resource, this directory called gholness, that's owned by me, that's the user. So when we look at other directories, there's another directory here, it's owned by a user named guest. So anyone whose guest can read, write, execute, anyone in this group underscore guest can read and execute and everyone else can read or execute. So if we look at this wheel here, wheel is owned by user root, which is a special user called the super user, has all privileges to do anything on the machine. And it's a file name, file name is called dot localized. And root can read or write, but not execute. Everyone who's in the wheel group can read, but they can't write or execute. And everyone else can read only, but not write or execute. Okay, so let me exit this and go back to PowerPoint. So we're back in PowerPoint. And what these user IDs, these group names, 
and these read, write, or execute privileges they do is control the access to certain things on your system, be they files or directories. Now, there's something called privilege escalation. Uh, in Ubuntu Linux, when you type the command sudo, it allows you to temporarily execute privilege commands provided uh, that you're set uh, in the system settings to be able to execute them. And that's so-called privilege execution. It's the temporary granting of privileges to a user if they're on the appropriate list of approved users to do certain types of privileged commands. And that's called privilege escalation. All right, so with that, uh, we'll stop there and we'll pick back up next time, continuing on to finish out the material from chapter one. So with that, as always, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a great weekend.